Welcome to the next installment in the Cadigo Genetics in CKD webinar series. Today is Episode 3, Applications of Genetic Testing in Hereditary Kidney Diseases. Some housekeeping notes, today's webinar is being recorded. You can ask your questions uh, early and often during the presentations. We'll have a brief Q&A period at the end. Just type in your questions in the chat interface and submit them, and questions that we don't have time for will be submitted to our expert presenters for individual follow-up. This Cadigo webinar series is supported by Natera. We'd like to thank them for their support. Our speakers today are Dr. Anthony Blyer, Professor of Nephrology at Wake Forest School of Medicine. Our second speaker is Dr. Carla Nestor, Director of the Division of Pediatric Nephrology, Dialysis and Transplantation at the University of Iowa. At this time, I'd like to turn it over to our first speaker. Go ahead, Dr. Blyer. Like many of you, KDGO has been an important source of information for me in many areas like chronic kidney disease, anemia, and bone mineral metabolism. I'm therefore very happy to contribute in some small way by sharing with you my experience over the past two decades in autosomal dominant tubulo interstitial kidney disease, also known as ADTKD. I would like to especially thank the moderator, the Terra webinars, and Tanya Green for helping to set up this program. My disclosures, I'm a contributor to UpToDate, and I have a diagnosis patent for ADTKD UMOD, which has minimal reimbursement. So today we're going to talk about autosomal dominant tubulo interstitial kidney disease, also known as ADTKD. We'll talk about the two most common types, ADTKD UMOD and MUC1. We'll speak about other causes of ADTKD briefly to set the stage for diagnosis. Then we'll discuss why we should do testing and then the approach to testing. First, we'll talk generally about ADTKD. In ADTKD, there is a 50% chance of inheritance, which is similar to polycystic kidney disease and results in many family members potentially having this condition. The disease is slowly progressive chronic kidney disease. So we tend to see patients in their 30s or 20s with a creatinine of 1 to 1.4 or up to 2. They have a bland urinary sediment. And the age of end-stage renal disease varies tremendously between 30 and 80 years, even within families. Patients with ADTKD UMOD often have doubt in their late teens. Patients with ADTKD MUC1 have no additional symptoms. They only have symptoms of chronic kidney disease. And the prevalence of these conditions is about 1% of the entire end-stage renal disease uh, uh, population. And I think that all of us have one family that has ADTKD in our, dia in our uh, patient population. As the disease is autosomal dominant, there are often many family members affected and this is very similar to ADT, ADPKD. However, sometimes we'll just see a parent and a child that will be affected. And we have to think that a person's chance of developing end-stage renal disease during their life is about 3.6%. The odds of both a parent and a child having a different kidney disease, therefore, are about one in a thousand. So when we see a patient and a child, a parent and a child with kidney disease, we should think genetic. ADTKD UMOD is the most common form of ADTKD. This condition is caused by mutations in the UMOD gene encoding uromodulin, which many people are more familiar with as TAM horse protein. TAM horse protein is secreted only in the thick ascending limb of Henle. It forms a sheet, which then forms a polymer, which is inside of the thick ascending limb. It enhances sodium reabsorption in the thick ascending limb and helps to protect from kidney stones as well as urinary tract infections. When patients have a mutation in, in UMOD, the protein cannot form correctly. The polymer, therefore, does not form, and the UMOD mutation in mean, the mutated UMOD protein deposits in the thick ascending limb cells 
as we see here in this slide. The clinical presentation of these patients is very similar. They have chronic kidney disease with variable progression to end-stage kidney disease. Often we see young patients like this and they have blood and protein in the urine, but in these patients there's a bland urinary sediment, which often leads us to be a little bit confused about the diagnosis. A kidney ultrasound will reveal normal or small kidneys as the disease progresses. Occasionally, there will be cysts in the kidney, which is similar to what is seen in other causes of chronic kidney disease. Gout does not occur in every family member with this disease, but often affects several family members. The age of end-stage renal disease is variable within and between families with a median age of end-stage renal disease of 54 years. On this figure, we see each family is represented by a column. In this family, the age of end-stage renal disease was 19 in one patient and 28 in the oldest patient in the family with this condition. However, in this family, we can see one family member started dialysis at about 22, whereas another family member did not start dialysis until 70. And we cannot really understand why we do not have an explanation for this variation in the age of onset of end-stage kidney disease. It's something that we're, we're studying uh, very diligently at present. When we see patients with this condition, we may see a person in their 30s who needs to start dialysis soon or get a kidney transplant, whereas their parent may be in their 60s and have CKD with a GFR in their 30s or 40s. Gout occurs in approximately half of the individuals who have this disorder. If we just look at the individuals who do develop gout, 25% of them will develop gout by age 22, and 50% will develop gout by age 26. So we see that there's a, a very younger age of onset of gout in this population, and the gout onset actually precedes the progression of chronic kidney disease. So it's not solely due to chronic kidney disease. We'll now talk about ADTKD Mach 1. Mach 1 uh, kidney disease is due to a mutation in mucoprotein 1. Mucoprotein 1 is expressed on many epithelial surfaces, including the kidney, the colon, the stomach, and sebaceous glands. Here we see a Mach 1 protein, and we see part of it is intracellular, and then there's a longer part of it that is outside of the cell. This part has a number of repetitive units. Each unit is composed of 20 amino acids, and these are the units to which the glucose and other, I should say, the carbohydrate polymers bind, giving Mach 1 the characteristic sticky uh, mucus uh, properties. In this condition, what we find in one of the repeats, there is a, a repeat of seven cytosines. And in this condition, in 95% of the cases, there is an addition of an eighth cytosine. This cytosine results in a frame shift mutation and leads to the addition from that point on of 20 different amino acids. This results in the deposition of this protein within the cell. So if you have ADTKD Mach1, you have one normal Mach1 protein, and then you have one abnormal Mach1 protein of which the terminal part has an abnormal protein sequence. This is similar to plastic in the ocean in that the cell does not have a natural way to remove this protein and it accumulates over time, leading to slowly progressive chronic kidney disease. While Mach1 is expressed in the breast, kidney, sebaceous glands, and GI tract, and we can see the mutated protein when we do biopsies in ADTKD Mach1 patients in these organs, the clinical manifestations of this disease only occur in the kidney. The median age of end-stage renal disease is 46 years in this disorder, and this is what I would call a disease that is pure chronic kidney disease. There's slowly progressive chronic kidney disease without any other manifestations. Hypertension, 
anemia, and gout occur as they would in other causes of CKD. Here we see the figure that I showed for the UMOD patients, and we can see almost exactly the same thing with families having a variable age of end-stage renal disease, in this case, between 22 and 50, and in this case, between about 25 and 81. And again, we don't have an explanation for this variation. 95% of MUC1 mutations are due to an addition of a cytosine to a 7-cytosine tract in the VNTR, the variable number of tandem repeats unit. Due to the high guanosine and cytosine content of this MUC1 repeat, routine genetic sequencing cannot be performed. So routine genetic panels are not uh, able to pick up mutations in the MUC1 gene, and commercial laboratories in the United States cannot perform MUC1 genetic testing. MUC1 genetic testing is currently available at the Broad Institute of MIT and Harvard at no cost. We prepare the place for MUC1 testing and we send them to the Broad Institute and we receive samples uh, from many different countries. If you're interested in sending samples, please contact me at ablier at wakehealth.edu. In Europe, there are several centers where MUC1 genetic testing can be formed, including in Erlangen, Germany with Michael Wiesner and in Madrid, Spain with Rosa Toro. Current routine genetic testing only identifies the MUC1 cytosine duplication. So we will only test for this cytosine addition. What if there was a guanosine or an adenosine here? Or what if instead of adding a nucleotide, we removed two nucleotides? We would then have the same frame shift protein and we would have the same disease, but these would not be picked up with current genetic testing. We have developed other tests to identify MUC1 mutations that are currently available through our laboratory, working with the laboratory of Stan Kamach at the Charles University in Prague. This includes immunostaining of urinary smears for the mutated MUC1 protein. I'll now briefly talk about other causes of ADTKD. One of these is ADTKD due to mutations in HNF1 beta. This disease is very uh, unique in that it has a variable penetrance and affected family members may suffer from none or one or more of the clinical symptoms. These include maturity onset diabetes abuse. So in this, we see patients pre presenting in their late teens with diabetes that's not insulin dependent and often they're not overweight. The abnormalities of the GU tract may also occur, including a single kidney, reflux, or a bicornuate uterus. Abnormal LFTs may occur. These are benign, and a liver biopsy will be unrevealing. Gout and hypomagnesia, hypomagnesemia, and CKD leading to end-stage renal disease also occur. When we look at this family, we can see the variable degree of symptoms in different family members, and even in a patient who has a mutation who's asymptomatic. ADTKD renin is due to mutations in the gene encoding renin. This leads to slowly progressive chronic kidney disease with manifestations of renin deficiency, including anemia in childhood, mild hyperkalemia, mild hypotension, hyperuricemia, and gout. There are other autosomal dominant disorders associated with tubular interstitial kidney disease. I've listed them here just as a setup for our, our talk about diagnosis in a few minutes. Many of these are associated with congenital abnormalities. When should I suspect ADTKD? We should suspect this condition when we see at least a parent and a child affected with kidney disease in a family. When the kidney disease is chronic, there is a bland urinary sediment. Why should I test for this condition when we know that many times there are no treatments for these disorders? First of all, patients and families who have suffered from generations desire to know why they have this condition. We've had actually a, a large number of families who self-referred to us to find a diagnosis and to understand why this disease occurs in their families. 
We can also avoid kidney biopsy by making a genetic diagnosis. Furthermore, kidney biopsy in this condition is often non-diagnostic. This allows patients to see if they have the disease and to plan for their future. Patients can also enroll in clinical trials to help to find a treatment. We've actually identified an exciting potential therapy that we hope to have available in five to 10 years for this disease. And so we think that diagnosis will hopefully and someday uh, help patients to get a treatment. Why should we diagnose ADTKD when specific treatments for kidney failure are unavailable? First of all, there are some treatments for specific aspects of this disease. We can treat gout and ADTKD UMOD. We can do this when patients are younger, so patients may present at age 17 or 18 with gout. If we know that they have ADTKD UMOD, we can then go ahead and place them on allopurinol early in life to prevent future occurrences. We can treat acidosis, hyperkalemia, and anemia in ADTKD renin, and we can treat diabetes in ADTKD HNF1 beta in a specific way. Most importantly, we can prepare for kidney transplantation. These patients are the best possible candidates for kidney transplant because the disease is isolated to the organ and does not recur. In the past, family members have been told they cannot donate because we have not had genetic testing and un been unable to tell if someone might be affected. Today, we can do genetic testing and identify potential living donors early. Do patients have regrets about testing positive for this disease? So when we do the testing, there will be a 50% chance that patients will have the disease. Of course, 50% of the patients will be very happy that they find out that they do not have the condition. But what about the patients who find out they do have the condition? So we did a survey of 54 individuals who thought they had normal kidney function and then had genetic testing and found out they had ADTKD. Interestingly, 60% of the patients who thought they had normal kidney function actually had CKD stage three or greater. We asked these patients, how did you feel about, how do you feel about having had genetic testing? with a score of zero being very unhappy, 50 neither happy nor unhappy, and 100 being very happy. And when we look at the scoring here on this graph, we see that 70% of the patients gave us a score of 90 to 100, indicating that they were very happy that they had undergone testing. And only one individual stated that they were mildly more unhappy than happy that they had testing done. We have a number of patient resources available, including booklets on ADTKD UMOD and MUC1, articles for physicians, an annual meeting, and webinars available, including about genetic testing and CKD and transplantation in ADTKD. Uh, please contact me if you would like any of these resources. So when we do testing, we can take a family that does not know why they have kidney disease, they cannot donate kidneys, uh, to other affected family members, give them a reason for the disease, let them help to contribute to research in the disorder, provide them a lot of education, provide education for their physician, and also help in identifying potential donors. What is the approach to testing? Previously, we used to use a gene-specific approach to testing where we would look at if the family had gout and test for UMOD, we would look at if they had anemia and hyperkalemia and test for renin mutations and so on. If one test was negative, we would then consider other testing or testing in our laboratory for Mach 1 mutations. This testing had several weaknesses. It was expensive and time consuming because we would test each gene separately and in order. One could also miss unexpected diagnoses. For example, if we were testing a patient for ADTKD and they actually had inherited focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, we would miss the diagnosis. Choosing a kidney gene panel. We want to choose a panel with as many genes as possible and that has easy accessibility for our patients. We would like the financing to be straightforward. The panel will not include testing for ADTKD MUC1. 
Whole exome sequencing can also be performed where a gene panel does testing for just a set of genes that are related to kidney disease, whole exome sequencing looks at the entire genome. With this, we can find novel gene mutations, but this is really more labor intensive and expensive at present and often requires testing many family members. So we do not recommend this testing at this point. Instead, we recommend a gene panel or testing for individual genes. This also does not test for MUC1 mutations. What are our results at Wake Forest from our cohort? We've tested a total of 665 families. 176 families have come directly from patients. These patients were not referred uh, by their doctors, but contacted us directly because they were frustrated at not having a diagnosis. Of these families, 141 families were found to have mutations in UMOD, causing ADTKD UMOD. 87 families were found to have mutations in the MUC1 gene. Nine families had renin mutations. 44 families had other causes of kidney disease. And 34 families had ADTKD of unknown cause that we're still looking for a cause. In addition to identifying families with the disorders, we were also able to diagnose many patients with both these disorders by testing additional family members. What is our approach at present to testing? We believe that we should take all patients with ADTKD and have them go through a gene panel. The gene panel should include genes for UMOD, renin, genes for diabetes such as HNF1-beta, and genes for other rare kidney diseases. We believe this will lead to a diagnosis in about 50% of families. If this gene panel is negative, we should then have these families undergo analysis for the cytosine duplication at the Broad Institute or at other European centers that test uh, for this mutation. This will get us to about 75%. The rest of these patients can be tested with urinary smears for the mutant MUC1 protein, and then this will get us to 80%, and in the remaining 20%, they will need whole exome sequencing and newer genetic techniques to find new genes. A place in patients with no family history. So some patients may have the symptoms of ADTKD MUC1, but they may not have any other affected family members. These individuals could have a de novo mutation, a new mutation. However, it is more likely that these individuals have nephronophthisis. Nephronophthisis is a condition, it's autosomal recessive, and it's associated with mutations that occur in proteins in the renal tubule cilia. They usually present in childhood. Nephronophthisis genes are included in several gene panels. At present, we do not perform MUC1 mutational analysis for individuals with no family history. We've had very limited success in testing of these individuals in the past. We don't have a specific treatment at this time. There are many, many individuals who present with CKD of unknown cause, and testing is expensive. When we have a specific treatment for this disease, I think that we will do a lot more testing of individuals without family history. What about screening of family members? So once someone is identified in the family, other family members will likely want to be tested. We need to carefully discuss risks, benefits, and alternatives. We should assume that the person has a disorder prior to testing. So there's a 50% chance the patient will have the disorder, even if they think they have normal kidney function. It's important that we tell the patients that we're not screening to rule out this disorder, but they really have a chance of having it. We, need, we should check the serum creatinine first. If it is elevated, we can set the stage that there's a good chance they may have the disease. However, we have also found mutations in individuals with normal kidney function. Another option, if patients do not want genetic testing, is to test serum creatinine annually, and if it goes above the normal range or if the GFR falls, to then consider testing. Testing of children, genetic society guidelines advise against testing at age less than 18 if no specific treatment is available. We should let the patients make their own decision when they reach adulthood. There are specific therapies for these disorders, so these should be tested for in childhood if both the parent and the child desire testing. 
We should avoid testing in ADTKD Mach 1, especially if age of end-stage renal disease in most families is older. So if there's a family that has age of onset of end-stage renal disease after age 50, uh, we don't really want to test children to let them know they have the disorder. If there are questions, we can refer these patients for genetic counseling. And we also have a webinar that is available for individuals when they're considering genetic testing. Take home points. Patients and families want to know why they have kidney disease, and testing will help us to identify these causes of kidney disease. Gene panels are available for all ADTKD genes except MUC1. Contact us or our colleagues in Europe for MUC1 genetic testing or any questions about ADTKD evaluation. Consider referring patients with ADTKD UMOD and REAM to us for patient support and clinical research opportunities. And here's my email. I'd like to thank our many collaborators over the last two decades, include our collaborators at the Charles University in Prague and the Broad Institute of Harvard and MIT. And I'd like to thank you all very much for listening to this presentation. Okay, thank you very much for that great presentation. Next up, we have Dr. Carla Nestor. Go ahead, doctor. Hello, I would like to thank the KDGO team for the opportunity to give this discussion today, as well as the Natera webinar group and my moderator today. My task today is dis to discuss applications of genetic testing in C3 glomerulopathy. The following are my disclosures. The objectives we will approach today are briefly reviewing the clinical presentation and diagnosis of C3 glomerulopathy, outlining the underlying causes of C3 glomerulopathy, sometimes referred to as C3G, review of the evidence for complement gene abnormalities as a cause of C3G, and finally, briefly discussing the, the treatment of C3G. First, we'll go through the disease definition. It's a rare glomerular disease. It's triggered by the alternative pathway of complement, specifically AP complement dysregulation. And it's most often a progressive disease with very significant renal mor morbidity in many patients. The current name, C3 glomerulopathy, was adopted in 2013. This has import when we begin thinking about what the potential natural history of this disease looks like. Presentation. There's a range of signs and symptoms at presentation, and it can range from incidental asymptomatic hematuria and proteinuria to acute glomerulonephritis with the associated findings, hypertension, nephrotic syndrome, varied degrees of renal failure, and even crescentic GN is well reported in this setting. Unfortunately, end-stage kidney disease does occur within 10 years in approximately 70% of children and 30 to 50% of affected adults. Of course, this is the major impetus to understand the underlying drivers of disease and the understanding of what potential therapies may be available. Histologically, recurrence can be documented almost immediately after renal transplantation. However, approximately 50% will actually lose their kidney transplant within 10 years, secondary to C3G. The epidemiology of C3G is actually quite difficult to ascertain, primarily because the majority of data comes from retrospective cohorts. And as I mentioned, the disease definition was really codified in 2013. So those prior cohorts are contaminated with a more heterogeneous population. If we take the four major published studies or major published cohorts, the incidence is probably 0.2 to 1 per million. So obviously a very rare disease, but genetic forms are going to be even rarer, as you'll see. Classically, it's a disease of children and young adults. In a recent study, registry study in the UK of 63 C3G patients, 78% of the patients presented in the pediatric age group. There is now uh, become known an association with paraprotein-mediated disease, and this does become important uh, 
technically around the age of 50, but may be important even earlier. It's just something to have in mind when you're considering this group of diseases. So how do we make the diagnosis? The diagnosis is purely a histopathologic diagnosis of isolated or dominant C3 staining on immune fluorescence of a kidney biopsy. And when we say dominant, what we really mean is at least two orders of magnitude greater than any other immunoreactant. There's a variable light microscopy pattern involved here. And while the classic view was that this was always going to be a membrane proliferative pattern, it turns out that perhaps only about 50% of patients will have MPGN. The rest may have a range of mesangial proliferative disease, endocapillary proliferative disease, or membrane proliferative disease. And of course, we already mentioned the possibility of crescents. The most widely known C3G is that of dense deposit disease. The very significant osmiophilic sausage-shaped deposits are classic for C3G. However, as you can see here, that really only accounts for about 33% of patients. It turns out the other group, 67% of the C3G patients have a much more fine appearing deposit. These are designated as C3 glomerulonephritis. So the difference being C3GN is a subcategory of C3G. No biomarker or genetic criteria are required for the disease definition. This is important because, again, we are reliant on a histology to make this diagnosis. And the analogy I will draw here is, is to FSGS. Of course, FSGS has primary forms and secondary forms. It won't surprise you that C3G also has primary forms and secondary forms. Again, no biomarker or genetic criteria are required for the diagnosis. What is required, and one of the most important things that came up in the consensus statement is, we must figure out a way to rule out post-infectious glomerulonephritis, because unfortunately, in about 30% of post-infectious GN patients, their biopsy may look exactly like C3G. That's another topic in, to go through the process of ruling that out. So what is the underlying pathogenesis? It's the alternative pathway of complement dysregulation we spoke of. A review of the alternative pathway. It's one of the three pathways, the other two being classical and lectin. Importantly, it is the excuse me, amplification loop of all three pathways. It's constitutively active. It's ready to respond to infection at any time. Because it is constitutively active, it is very important that there be functional regulators present at all times. Why? Because these limit excess complement consumption, excess complement activity, also limit the accumulation of complement breakdown products, which is, of course is critical in the diagnosis of C3G. What are the mechanisms of complement dys dysregulation? Of course, this is meant to be a discussion about the genetics of C3G. However, it I would be remiss if I didn't mention that the actual primary mechanism of underlying disease is autoantibody mediated. And in fact, these autoantibodies are directed at one or both of the central enzymes in the alternative pathway of complement. These enzymes are the C3 and C5 convertases. I'll show you a cartoon of those in just a moment. Large databases have indicated that the percentage of antibodies are, for C3 nephritic factor, 50 to 80% of patients will have this as the underlying reason their alternative pathway is dysregulated, whereas 50% of patients will have a C5 nephritic factor. Alternatively, the discussion for today is the secondary drivers of C3 glomerulopathy, the genetic variants. Fortunately, Nat, both natural and lab-generated animal models confirm the role of complement in C3G. So I thought it was worth beginning the discussion with some of our animal models and how we got to where we are today. The alternative pathways begins with spontaneous hydrolysis of C3 to C3B. Cleavage of B in the presence of D 
creates a BB. The combination of C3B and BB, the gold circles in the center, create the C3 convertase. The C3 convertase cleaves additional C3, amplifying the process started by hydrolysis and amplifying to create more and more convertase and more cleaved C3. The complex of C3BB with the addition of an additional C3B creates the C5 convertase. The C5 convertase enzymatically cleaves C5 to create the initial protein of the terminal lytic complex of the complement pathways. This protein is often referred, at, referred to as C5B through 9 or MAC membrane attack complex. MAC forms on pathogens or self cells in the absence of regulators and is the major effector of this arm of the innate immune system. Importantly, as you can see in the blue box, H plus I, complement factor H and I, I being the cofactor, are important regulators of the AP. As I mentioned, because it's constitutively active, those regulators are critical. So now to the animal models. A native Norwegian pig model of factor H deficiency because of a gene mutation, a factor H gene mutation, had the disease phenotype of C3G. Animal models created in the laboratory, specifically mouse models of factor H gene abnormality or factor H deficiency, also have the phenotype of C3G. Interestingly, and uh, a finding that pointed very clearly to the alternative pathway involvement is if you cross that factor H knockout with a factor B knockout, meaning you can't create the convertase even though you also don't control the pathway well, these animals did not have the same degree of C3G. Of course, uh, we didn't call it C3G in 2002, but they did not have the same degree of proliferative disease as we would call it today. Similarly, if you knocked out I instead of H, again I being the minor cofactor here, if you knocked out I regulation, you also, you did in fact get C3G or a proliferative disease, it just wasn't quite as significant as if you knocked out the major uh, regulator H. And then if you knocked out C5 in an animal model along with factor H, so this is a double knockout, again you find some amelioration of disease. Yes, it's true, you can't regulate the, the AP as well, but you also cannot make MAC now. And again, this may seem somewhat complicated, but I think what it does is it provides us the information we need to then now begin looking at humans. So I've already indicated that the major driver of disease is in fact an antibody to the C3 convertase or an antibody to the C5 convertase. I can also share with you that there are very well characterized humans who have factor H gene abnormalities who clearly have the C3G phenotype. There are also human cases of C3 gene abnormality. So these are C3 genes that produce proteins that are not easily regulated by factor H. These humans also have the C3G phenotype. While these are well characterized, what most clinicians will run into instead are the more sporadic findings when overall genetic testing is done. And in fact, the most likely findings will be, or the most likely findings will be in C3, factor B, factor H, and factor I. And I think that after discussing uh, the activity of the alternative pathway and after discussing what has been proven in the animal models, this may make sense. So if we summarize that, 25% of C3G patients carry rare or novel variants in complement-related genes. They tend to be in the convertase genes, so in that C3 and factor B 
or they tend to be in the regulators in complement factor H or factor I. I think it's worth spending a few moments on this idea of the complement factor H hotspot. Those, many of you may know that uh, the other complement mediated kidney disease we often talk about is atypical HUS. In that setting, the hotspot, if you will, is in the 17, 18, 19, and 20 SCRs of the complement factor H. This is important because in order to prevent atypical HUS, you must have complement control on the cell surface. So that is the portion of the factor H protein that binds the cell surface. A mutation here would potentially alter that ability and then therefore set the patient at risk for atypical HUS. Alternatively, in C3G, the hotspot of factor H tends to be in SCRs 1, 2, 3, and 4. If you notice, those are the SCRs that bind C3B. If you can't bind C3B, there will be more difficulty in controlling the pathway at that level. And this is uh, the general concept, if you will, of there being a differential hotspot for one complement-mediated disease versus another. Moving forward, we also know that there are genetic abnormalities in the CFHR5 gene. This is the most well-known as a founder mutation in the Cypriot population. And then finally, when we think about familial C3G, we have to think about rearrangements in the CFHR genes, particularly as that results in fusion proteins. Again, it's a somewhat complex topic, but I think uh, I would like to show you a few examples of that. First of all, the cartoon depicts what the complement factor H and the CFHR genes look like on the chromosome. This is important. Their proximity is important, but was, what is even more important is the homology that these proteins have. You can see here factor H on the top, CFHR4 on the bottom, and you can see they've been lined up such that, that SCR6 of factor H is incredibly homologous to SCR1 of all of the CFHRs. I, I hope that you can see that. Similarly, SCR7 of factor H is homologous to CFHR1, SCR2, etc. The point to offer to you here is, is that this tremendous degree of homology lends itself to recombination events that create fusion genes, which then have the potential to create fusion proteins. So let's do some examples. I should, this is my, my hint to remind you that in order to be able to detect these, you cannot do NGS or next generation sequencing. You must do an assay called multiplex ligation dependent probe amplification. And so that would be one of the things I would suggest to you when you're thinking about genetics on your patients. You, you really should make sure that an MLPA is done. Now, of course, we can all agree this, these are incredibly rare events, but so is C3G. So here's what it looks like. In the top panel, you can see with the normal appearance of those SCRs, for instance, for factor H-related 1, you have 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5 in purple. Factor H-related 2, 1, 2, 3, 4 in gray, et cetera. Now go down to the bottom panel, and, what, and let's just use one example, where you have the fusion of 1 and 2 of factor H-related 2 with 1 through 9 of factor H related 5, and you create a fusion dream that looks like this. So once you have these fusion genes, you have the risk for having an alteration in the alternative pathway complement activity. And so these can become very important events, and as I had mentioned, are in fact the major cause of familial C3G, the transmission of these throughout the family. One small interesting point is that um, the dimerization motif shared by CFHR1, 2, and 5 also add an important aspect of this idea of the fusion gene. So you might recall from the previous figure, just looking at the very top panel here, for FHR2, the gray 1 and 2. That is the two N-terminal SDR domains of factor H-related 2. These enable the formation of both homeo and heterodimers between the CFHR. 
that perhaps is perhaps not as important to you, except that if you look closer, because of this fusion, you now have two one and two domains. So now you have an increased risk of this hetero or homero, homeo, excuse me, hetero or homeodimerization, and this in fact may create proteins that are now competitive for factor H, and as we already discussed, factor H being the major regulator, either a, a direct genetic abnormality or a competition with one of these secondary genetic abnormalities may become the reason that the pathway is dysregulated. So what is the clinical application of the genetic information that I've shared with you? Well, unfortunately, the natural history data are insufficient to tell us whether recurrence in our, a given patient is more likely to be the case, whether it's autoimmune versus a genetic form. So we don't know if it's worse or more um, problematic over the patient's lifetime to be a genetic form or not. We do not know that. We do suspect or we strongly believe that genetic studies do allow you to consider whether there is uh, increased risk for recurrences. In fact, the new KDGO guidelines, specifically the clinical practice guidelines on glomerular disease, and we're talking about the C3 glomerulopathy chapter, will in fact suggest a number of ways to look at the complement system in this group of patients. But particularly, the KDGO guidelines does recommend genetic testing in this group of patients for the possibility that you could pick up that that uh, 25 or 28 percent or so of patients who have a genetic cause of their C3G. I would put forth here that that's most likely to be important when you have a patient, well, maybe in two circumstances. First of all, when we have directed or targeted therapeutics, but then second of all, when you're preparing a patient for transplant so that you can understand the risk for recurrence and the risk to potential donors. Of course, we can recognize that sometimes the genetic results may require specialized interpretation services. So what about the treatment of C3G? Not unlike understanding the natural history, as in who's going to recur or relapse and who is not, we also do not know whether the various treatments that we may try currently, because all of them are nonspecific, whether they are going to be more effective in autoimmune forms versus genetic forms. There is speculation that genetic forms may be more persistent disease and may have uh, more direct complement abnormalities, but that's just speculation. And I think for the purposes of treatment the, currently, we have to think of these as similar diseases. Current treatments are driven by expert opinion. There's, and as I already indicated, that's primarily because there's absence of targeted therapeutics, but also because there are absence of clinical trials. We don't have well-described attempts to use these medications that we are currently using and understand their, effect, their efficacy. And I'll give you an example of that in just a moment. So what has been recommended? It's been recommended based on whether the patient has moderately active or severe disease. And we don't need to spend a lot of time discussing this, uh, but the point is, is that um, because we can't directly at this time approach the AP for instance, we do not directly have a C3 convertase inhibitor. We must use secondary medications that are what we would call essentially anti-inflammatory medications such as prednisone and mycophenolate. They're not based on clinical trial, as already mentioned. They do not directly go towards a complement specific component of this disease. And unfortunately for all of us, there's a highly variable, variable response across cohort, cohorts. Excuse me. I offer you four of these cohorts here, a Spanish, Turkish, and then two uh, US cohorts. And you can see if you follow the response line that it goes from 86% down to 12.5% of those who will have responded to mycophenolate, for instance. So you can see we are not quite where we need to be with respect to treatment, whether this is autoimmune disease or genetic. So what is our goal? Our goal is targeted therapeutics. And so if you go back to understanding where the genetic abnormality may be in these pathways, if you understood that the genetic abnormality may be either in C3 or factor B, it may make sense to consider a factor D inhibitor 
or a factor B inhibitor, or even a C3, a direct C3 inhibitor. These are not available yet, but I many of these agents are in the pipeline now, and so we uh, look forward to understanding whether they will indeed be efficacious in this setting. And then finally, if the problem really is in C5 or in the membrane attack complex, for instance, you may find out uh, that a C5 inhibitor or even a C5A receptor blocker may be useful. And again, I've chosen these as possibilities primarily because they are in fact in the pipeline and are something for, for us to look forward to, whether it is truly genetic, mediated disease, or autoimmune. I would like to thank uh, both my uh, Division of Pediatric Nephrology colleagues be, for their wonderful support on a daily basis, but also um, because I work in the Molecular Autolaryngology and Renal Research Laboratory, I'm very, very blessed with uh, a number of, of very brilliant minds surrounding me and helping me learn about complement and help me care for my patients. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We do have some questions, so we'll just jump right in. One of my patients has AD, TKD, and wants to have their seven-year-old tested. How should I advise them? I think it depends on the disease. So if the condition is AD, TKD, UMOD, you might consider testing. But this is even before the patient would be likely to develop gout. So I would tend to wait till the patient is older maybe 13 or 14, so that we can really have a discussion with them and they can be part of the decision. We really want the children to be able to understand the condition and to want to have testing before we perform it. Okay, great. Next question. Uh, here's a good one. Uh, the commercial genetics lab uh, that I used told me that they can test for MUC1 mutations. Is that true? Uh, there's only one laboratory that we know of in Europe that can do genetic testing for MUC1. A lot of times uh, people will be told that, that they can get testing for it, but it really is unavailable at other institutions. In that case, I would refer them to us and we could discuss with the laboratory and give them a good answer regarding this. Okay, great. Uh, does it matter what commercial laboratory I use for UMOD genetic testing? If you want to do specific UMOD genetic testing, you should go to a laboratory that tests all of the exons of the UMOD gene and not just the exons where most mutations occur. We want to make sure that we rule out UMOD disease definitively with testing of all exons. Uh, my patient has limited funds and will be paying for genetic studies out of pocket. Is there a way that I can do a stepwise approach to their genetic testing for C3G? Ah, that's a great question. Well, as I mentioned to you during the discussion, actually if you wanted to do a stepwise uh, fiscal approach, you would likely begin with autoantibody assessment of your patient since that's the more likely underlying cause of their C3G. After that, however, if you still need to define what may be causing the patient's C3G, because of most next generation sequencing panels these days will include all of the genes I have mentioned, it probably is not make sense to uh, pick individual genes to test. Having said that, if you are going to choose individual genes, you would choose, of course, the C3, the factor B, the factor H, and the factor I, since those have been the ones that have been identified previously as potential causes of C3G. And then, of course, don't forget uh, that assay I mentioned, the MP MLPA, as one of the assays. Okay, great. Next question. Uh, if my patient's genetic studies are negative, do I have to do follow-up with testing for copy number variants or fusion genes? Oh, that, thank you. That's similar to the last question to a degree in that, um, yes, if you do next generation sequencing, which is what most of the panels are these days that actually test complement genes. If you do only next generation sequencing, that is, a, that, is a, um, that will not be able to pick up uh, the same degree of copy number, number variants as MLPA would. And that is, that is 
very possible that you would miss these fusion genes. Again, that would be particularly important in, a, in familial cases, but is very likely to be important in the sporadic case where you have found or it would be important for you to test in that area in sporadic cases where you have not found a better cause of the C3G up to that point. Okay, very good. I have a 15-year-old patient with a C3 gene variant as the probable cause of his C3G. Should I recommend familial testing for the two younger siblings? Uh, that can be a more difficult question. So the C, um, first of all, um, C3G in families is incredibly rare, and it is probably even more rare outside of those um, recombination events that I mentioned earlier. So the fact that the 15-year-old has a C3 gene abnormality, it's very likely to be de novo. Now, the only way you would know is to test, but, uh, uh, and I will, I will say that this tends to be local uh, practice. Um, I would generally not recommend testing siblings who are unaffected, meaning they don't have any signs of glomerular disease, unless a genetic counselor has been approached and you've had a discussion about what, um, what the results mean to that individual, in part because of the anxiety that can be provo provoked from finding gene abnormalities when there's no clinical phenotype, but also in part because of the penetrance of this disease. We do believe it's multifactorial. We do believe that it's possible that an individual in the family could have the exact same gene variant but never get disease, is that because there are multiple factors that could be playing a role? Yes, very likely. So all of that has to be sorted through before uh, I would recommend gene testing for unaffected, so clinically phenotype completely negative or normal siblings. Okay, great. On behalf of the audience, I want to thank both of you for your great presentations and deft handling of the questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Watch your email for information about Episode 4 in the Cadigo Genetics and CKD webinar series. At this time, we will end the webinar, and you may now disconnect.